Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Cody Winkler. Uh, welcome to my talk. This is Malware, Then, Now, and How. I wish I had come up with a better title, but um, I was a little inebriated when I first came up with it, and this was the best that I could come up with at the time. So, a um, little about me. I'm a one-stripe white belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I really love Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's like the hacking form of martial arts. Like, there's this move called the Gogo -go Plata where you can actually choke someone with your ankle. It's like super legit. Um, I love playing Diablo 3. I'm an Air Force veteran and uh, I'm a network engineer at Jack Henry and Associates. So, if you've ever been to an InfoSec conference before, there's this running joke of Sun Tzu slides. And um, it's entirely to trollattrition.org. They have like some kind of pet peeve with InfoSec professionals quoting Sun Tzu. So, so let me read the quote to you. Um, Appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend. March swiftly to places where you are not expected. Sun Tzu, the art of war. And I think this quote really holds true for malware analysis and reverse engineering because when developers are creating applications Eventually, somewhere down the line, there's going to be a reverse engineer or a malware analysis that, or analyst that pops out of nowhere and it's just like, ha, gotcha. So I thought that this was you know, pretty applicable to, to the talk. As a quick overview, we're going to be comparing malware from days of old and current times, looking at growing threat landscapes, why competing uh, with other antivirus vendors and trying to protect end users against malware is still an uphill battle and we're also going to take a very quick look at some analytical tools. So back in the days of old you would see infections from malware such as Zeus which targeted banking credentials, Conficker. So if you've ever seen a tutorial on the Metasploit framework you're going to know automatically what MSOA 067 was. So that's exactly how Configure spread it itself. Um, additionally, through admin shares and removable media. And as of 2015, it was estimated that there are still 400,000, roughly 400,000 infections of Configure. You'd also see some fake antivirus platforms that were actually loaded with malware. Um, the Storm botnet was uh, pretty interesting in and of itself. It would spread itself through email attachments uh, trying to spread fake news about some apocalyptic storm in Europe. So I thought that that was pretty funny. It ended up uh, being estimated between 1 and 50 million different infections, and the bot itself was pretty interesting. It would actually counter DDoS if it detected that it was being analyzed or if it detected that there was someone trying to um, mess around with the botnet itself. Uh, it also came with a few different encryption keys, the author wanted uh, to sell the platform so that other people could use it, and different keys allowed um, other, other people to access different part of the botnet. And it was super interesting because someone actually developed a tool that would collect all of the keys, and eventually that's how the Storm botnet ended up going away. So I thought that was kind of funny. And then, um, so that being said, we also had the NSA, well, possibly, possibly the NSA. Stuxnet, Flame, Dooku. So this was really the turning point for malware back in roughly the 2007 to 2009 time frame. We would see uh, infections in really strange places in the Middle East where, uh, at least with the case of Stuxnet, it, it leveraged three different zero days within the Windows platform. Um, it also emulated real uh, proprietary PLC code, which ended up mess messing up some nuclear centrifuges in a power plant. Um, Dooku was pretty similar to Stux Stuxnet in the fact that its code was also digitally signed with um, stolen certificates. So it would actually appear like a legitimate program, and it took a while for analysts to actually catch, catch up with what was going on. So how about these days? Well, as was discussed in Aaron's talk, uh, 
IoT is becoming a huge, huge topic, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, we're seeing some Mirai variants um, ever since the malware author released the source code onto his GitHub. Um, Anime and Kami, Qbot, these are all um, competing or rival malware families that also infect IoT devices, uh, similar with Bash, Bash Lite. And we're also seeing a spike in ransomware. I can't remember the quote, but I think I have um, some statistics on the different infection types that are coming up here shortly. Um, interesting note, uh, before I get into this, we also have Shadow Broker Leaks and Shame Shame NSA, possibly NSA. Um, interesting note about one of the Shadow Broker Leaks. Uh, Microsoft actually released a security bulletin for the Eternal Blue exploit before the exploit was publicly leaked to the or publicly leaked, which is quite suspicious. Um, so normally when public disclosures are made, it happens re relatively the same style. The vendor will usually release a patch or a fix, and then the whoever discovered the vulnerability will do a public disclosure afterward. But um, usually there's a pretty significant time frame between the events. So it was, it was pretty suspicious to see a security bulletin, I believe, back in March. And then a couple weeks later, Shadow Broker leaks with all of these you know, highly sophisticated attack tools. So how does this keep happening? Uh, back in the day, uh, lots of software pirating led to a lot of infections, uh, drive-by attacks, Browsing habits kind of go hand in hand to an extent, but um, an end user can usually tell when they're about to be wrecked you know, through bad browsing habits. There will be a pop-up, 1-800, call us and we'll fix your computer if you give us access. Um, Drive-by attacks, they can be a little more subtle, and I would, I would be surprised if an uh, average user can recognize a drive-by attack, but um, you know, still, they do, they do go hand in hand to an extent. Removable media is also uh, still prevalent as a major issue for how infections happen. Um, and I think, you know, soapbox time, one of, one of the biggest reasons is people just not using security products or keeping their systems updated. And the NSA. And the Russians. So from back in 2007... Uh, there was a large amount of malware that was Trojan-based, and it's interesting because there, there really isn't that much anymore. I mean, yes, there's, it's still really widespread and prevalent, but it, compared with a decade ago, we're, we're not seeing it as much. We're seeing more of a conversion toward uh, the ransomware family and more for uh, financial crimes. But compared with today, you can see a large, large dramatic increase in man, uh, ransomware and uh, consequentially a uh, smaller uh, market share of malware that you know, still is Trojan based. But um, the main two perpetrators are mobile and IoT. So it was estimated back in 2007 that there was roughly 1.1 billion users on the internet. Um, this doesn't come from a reputable source, so I can't say for certain if there's that many, but it's estimated from that same source. Um, I think it's uh, networkshare.com or networkmarketshare.com. Um, they estimate now that there's roughly 3.3 billion users, which is good because we'd like to see um, more internet ac access within countries that aren't as well off as, as we are. So. Well, with that, though, comes more malware. Another interesting note, um, currently 7% of the internet is estimated as still using Windows XP, which would explain why there's a lot of older variants still running around. Um, interesting, you know, with the free update for Windows 10, we're still seeing a lot of Windows 7 users. Um, and then you have the uh, Mac OS X and Linux families that have their own different areas of um, consumption on the internet. So I just want to advise anyone, if anyone here works in mobile antivirus or is a developer for mobile antivirus, I just want to give you a you know, for, forewarned trigger warning. You may be slightly <laughs> peeved by this next slide. Um, there are some quirks with mobile antivirus. 
uh, I am under the impression that it's one, not reliable, and you're probably more likely to be infected by downloading mobile antivirus, especially if it's not from a reputable vendor. But um, there were some trends that have been noticed over the last couple of years. The App Store uh, is actually quite good on tracking third-party applications uh, that are released, and they're usually pretty good at cracking down on them. The Google Play Store, it, not quite to the extent uh, as the App Store, but they're, Google's getting better about it. And um, you know, to, to even really get infected, uh, at least you know, the, the likelihood of being infected, you really have to have developer tools, uh, developer mode enabled on your Android device. And you usually physically have to click on a suspicious APK to actually, uh, for to, to likely be infected. I'm not saying that you can't be infected from the Play Store. I'm just saying it's more likely if you set yourself up for that way. So th it's a really slippery slope. And then with mobile antivirus, it's not truly signature based. It's they from the applications that I look through. Uh, for the most part, they just look through a given package and you grep through for known strings that were uh, associated with different types of malware. So uh, there's a few projects on GitHub it originally designed for penetration testers where um, you can actually run this script and it'll go through your APK, dissect it, change out all the strings that are associated with the, uh, the MSF payload for Android. It'll change all of these strings and then when you can recompile it, um, for the most part it tends to not be caught by mobile antivirus again. So it it's definitely an industry that needs to be looked at more, especially as users are doing more online banking these days. So some trends that we've been seeing, um, typically you know, some really popular strains of malware are reused over and over again, but rehashed with packers and cryptors. So um, difference between packers and cryptors, cryptors will actually go in change the different instruction sets for a given application. And um, so it's a kind of a, like a pseudo encryption. They're a little more hard to, to actually look through than um, executables that are packed, where packing is more of a compression based. So most malware tends to be uh, crap that's just designed to like steal account credentials and DDoS, but there are a few variants out there. Um, that are quite serious, uh, especially back in the day with Zeus, there's um, more, more and more strains of financial malware that are just wreaking havoc. But um, ransomware and Internet of Things are still publicly enemy number one. You can kind of throw mobile in there as well, but um, ransomware and IoT are pretty prominent these days. So speaking of Internet of Things, Lots of people talk about IoT. Um, we had a great presentation by Aaron earlier, um, just showing the, the scope of what's out there. And IoT is not limited to security cameras. It, it's, as Aaron said, there's watches, there's, there's even refrigerators that, out there that are internet enabled, um, DVRs and so forth. But it's, Quite astounding, actually. There's, it's estimated that roughly 40% of IoT devices are in businesses and manufacturing, 30% uh, in healthcare facilities, and 8% in retail. As you can see from the notes, we can also count point-of-sale systems. Um, I'm not sure if anyone recalls the Target breach from back in 2014, but there was a vendor for Target that created point-of-sale systems for them. So the v vendor is actually the one that got compromised in this, but through them, they ended up getting into Target's corporate network. And through that, the compromise of roughly 110 million credit card and debit card details. I think, it was, uh, I think the leak was estimated at right around 11 gigabytes. So if you can imagine a, an 11 gigabyte text file with just credit card information, it's quite astounding. So how does Internet of Things tie in with malware? Welcome to Mirai. So Mirai, I like to refer to it as the IoT Death Star. Um, it was compromised mostly of cameras and DVRs, um, numbered in the hundreds of thousands. It 
spread itself by scanning for IoT devices with weak access credentials. Um, an interesting note about Mirai was there were hard-coded address ranges within the source code that actually showed that it wouldn't scan internal address ranges. Um, there was a few company address ranges. I think HP was one of them that they wouldn't scan. Um, the Department of Defense and, uh, for some strange reason, the United States Post Office, um, Postal Service. I'm not sure why they included that in there, but um, it was intended to avoid detection. Ironically, it also removes competitive malware from, from compromised devices. I thought that was an interesting note. Um, there are uh, other strains of malware out there that do that, but this one in particular is just kind of funny. Um, and its primary form for attacking was generating GRE traffic. And GRE traffic uh, is usually used for creating end-to-end -end VPN tunnels or tunnels between network infrastructure. So it was really interesting to see that it was um, generating GRE traffic to uh, for its attack methods. Because there's, if you've ever seen firewall rules before, there, I I would be surprised if you were to ever see a firewall rule that restricted GRE traffic. But Jan to the exciting stuff. Brian Krebs was the first victim of Mirai uh, back in September of 2016. Uh, he was hit by, his website was hit by a 620 gigabit per second DDoS, and I can't remember which provider he was on. Uh, I want to say it was Akamai, but um, uh, whoever was hosting his website actually dropped him because they were seeing so, so much traffic coming through their infrastructure. And they just didn't want to deal with it. But wait, there's more. So Mirai also attacked a French web hosting company called OVH, and this one was pretty incredible. It set um, a record level for the amount of traffic uh, ever received by, by a victim for denial of service traffic. It reached up to 1.5 terabits per second. And um, if you've ever seen some Cloudflare, Cloudflare presentations, you'll know that their engineers get excited whenever it goes 100 gigabits per second. Um, because usually the interfaces on their devices, they'll, they'll either go to 10 gigabits per second or 40 gigabits per second. So whenever it goes over that threshold, uh, a lot of people get excited. You all get a DDoS. So this picture is a little misleading. Um, so these websites individually were not directly attacked. Uh, they were all hosted by DIN, which is a global DNS provider. And... DIN was hit really hard, uh, especially on the eastern coast of the United States. Um, I think it was earlier this year or late last year, but the traffic was substantial and it ended up affecting several huge websites such as GitHub, Reddit, Airbnb, and Twitter. But moving forward, how are these malware authors still beating antivirus? I mean, so the industry itself has had 20 years. Uh, roughly 20 to 30 years to come up with different methods to track and identify malware. And malware is still a huge problem. But to kind of explain how malware authors are able to do this, they employ mechanisms that will either you know, abrupt the analytical process or stop it altogether. And that can be done through detecting debuggers, uh, detecting if it's living in a virtual machine, um, detecting other processes, so if there's like a protocol anal analyzer or uh, uh, oftentimes some sys internal tools uh, will be used to, to help with identifying what malware can actually do. And these, these are all you know, relatively simple to, to look through. And it's kind of a problem, but on that same note, um, the analytical, analytical tools and um, from what we understand of malware now, it's getting easier for us to siphon through all of these anti-reversing mechanisms. But they also employ uh, some, excuse me, some, some methodologies that I've talked about earlier, um, such as cryptors and packers. So again, that's talking about um, you know, pseudo-encrypting an executable uh, versus compre compressing an executable. And so when 
this is kind of why signature based detection died off a couple of years ago just because there there would be malware strains that would be used over and over again and they'd be like well why aren't our signatures picking up on it and it's because that the malware authors were messing around with the uh, the instruction set and changing it up so that the signature wouldn't be valid anymore at least for for that next generation of the strain but they also employ some stealth mechanisms um, dll injection is actually a uh, legitimate technique. A lot of antivirus actually uses uh, DLL injection to insert hooks into other processes to uh, look at what what's happening in memory. But it's interesting that malware often uses DLL injections because um, with that comes risks of um, privileges and where the malware ends up as far as the, the flow of execution goes. Um, another technique that's um, been employed more recently uh, is the dropping of rogue drivers. So there was one sample I recall reading an article on where the malware would actually create a driver and it would um, the driver itself would open up a, a shadowed file system and drop a rootkit into the shadowed file system, system and the antivirus wouldn't be able to see it. So how can we beat them? Well, we can do this through the analytical process by um, rewriting instructions or knopping them out um, as we're analyzing them in runtime. Uh, we can also attempt to reverse the obfuscation or uh, attempt to decrypt uh, given samples, but it's typically not, re not as reliable as just analyzing it in runtime. Uh, we can also trick the sample into running. Um, setting up a lab where you're running two, two instances of virtual machines. Um, we'll be talking about Remnux here shortly. Uh, getting kind of short on time, so I'm going to blast through these next few slides. But um, we can also change the registry values of security products. I recall reading an article where an analyst was having trouble analyzing a sample because the sample would actually detect that it was in a virtual machine. So what he ended up doing was... He ended up changing what VM platform he was using. I think he ended up using QMU to start um, analyzing it further. And um, these are similar techniques that one could employ. And there are, there's at least one example that I can think of where the malware was actually exploited. Um, WannaCry from the first rendition of WannaCry, uh, there was a, uh, so malware tech blog uh, was the original person that kind of started getting the ball rolling on how to defeat WannaCry. And he discovered that there was a mutex created for all of the threads within WannaCry that would actually stop the malware from starting if the mutex wasn't closed. So there's two main types of malware analysis. There's static and dynamic. Static is where you're opening... Um, the instruction set of the executable without actually executing the malware. And this is interesting to do because we can actually see what libraries are being referenced from the malware and get a better understanding of what it can actually do before we actually see what's going on. Um, dynamic analysis, that's where you end up opening it up in an application like a debugger and um, seeing what it actually does while it's executing. And you can watch routines happen in real time. So some useful tools. Um, quick note about the differences between disassemblers and debuggers. Uh, disassemblers will convert machine code to human readable assembly instructions. And um, debuggers will, to an extent, do the same thing. It's just uh, debuggers will allow for uh, modifying an executable during runtime. Uh, so some very popular disassemblers. IDA Pro is probably top dog in this industry. Um, and Radar 2, which is, I believe, free. Um, some debuggers, Immunity Debugger and Ali Debug, um, these are quite popular, but there are some others, um, such as uh, X64 Debugger. I think that's a recent one. It's open source, and it has support for 32-bit and 64-bit. Um, Immunity Debugger is actually was originally a spin-off of Ali Debug, and I think Ali Debug is 
pretty much all but dead now. So I think immunity debugger is the way that the industry in that area is starting to go. But dependency walker is another useful tool. Uh, you can see what libraries are actually loaded by an application. Um, hex editors, uh, everything in sys internals is great and it's free to download from Microsoft. I wish they would actually include it with Windows because it, it's helpful. Sys internals is helpful for more than just reverse engineering. Um, there's instances, if you've ever had an application crash, there's sys internals tools that will help you figure out why that crash happened. Uh, Remnux is a Linux VM, so Kali Linux for penetration testing, Remnux for reverse engineering. It's quite astounding what's, what's all included in it. And then PEID, it's a dead project now, but um, it helps with detecting um, common packers, common cryptors, common uh, compilers. And I'll give you a quick demo here while I still have time. So I was hoping that my tech demo would be awesome, but um, I'm just going to verify that I can actually use my lab. Uh-oh. So while I'm waiting for my Windows machine to load, I'll give you a, some intro to Remnux. So there's this suite, which is called iNet Sim, and it will simulate common internet services such as um, NTP, DNS, uh, HTTP. It's, it's quite useful when you're analyzing different traffic. I'm sorry? That's, I'm not worried about that at the moment. Um, would you like me to make it full screen? We can't see it. We're on your other side. Oh. How long has that been happening? All right, all right. So iNet Sim will simulate different IP services or uh, different internet services, um, DNS, NTP, HTTPS, etc. Um, we also use this. I uh, couldn't quite get the DNS functionality to work within iNet Sim, so we'll just do this. Get Wireshark going, and while we're waiting for that. So what we're looking at now is some libraries from the Mirai, Mirai source code. And within here, you can take a look at all of the different attack vectors that are present within Mirai. And um, over here, so this one, this part of the source code was really funny because there was this comment in here, but bruh, what if method is the default value? Why don't it seg fault because read only string? And just through reading that, you can kind of get an idea of how old the malware author was. And it did turn out he was in his uh, early 20s. So um, additionally, we have the scanner header, or I'm sorry, the uh, scanner portion of Mirai. And we can actually see all of the different credentials that Mirai uses. So while I go over here, am I good on time? Okay. No, people are getting hungry. I don't want to dig into anyone's lunchtime. So.
Okay, so I wasn't able to find the original version of WannaCry that had the kill switch within it within its uh, executable, but I do have this version, and um, so what we're going to do is we are going to take a look at the traffic that it generates after it runs. Um, so we see that there's some different SMB traffic that's coming into into play here. I wish you could actually see it getting infected. Well, I guess it's gone, so that kind of concludes my talk. Um, on a final note, though, um, use antivirus and keep your systems up to date. I mean, it, it's not that hard to do, and you, the benefits outweigh the risks. So uh, additionally, egress rules really aren't that um, found through, throughout many environments. So I, I would advise, uh, if you're running network infrastructure, or if you manage it, um, consider you know, setting up some egress or outbound rules. Uh, change default login credentials, and um, pray the NSA keeps their attack tools under control. And if you'd like to get more information on reverse engineering and malware analysis, kernelmode.info is a great resource. Um, I've had fantastic times interacting with their users, and they usually are all quite respectful, and I don't think I've any seen debauchery on that website. So um, that being said, I'll take a couple of questions before turning it over to Beth. So the question was, what do you recommend for antivirus for non-Windows? Um, kind of hypocritical of me, because I actually don't use antivirus at all on Linux. Um, so to protect myself, I usually set up a number of IP tables, and I'm generally watching my system through HTOP. And that being said, um, thank you all for your time, and I hope this has been informative. That being said, I'll turn it over to Beth.